So we've spent all our time in the salt mines of lossless compression. We've suffered through assignments one, two, and three. Uh, and maybe now we're ready to start asking existential questions like, what is the point of compressing things? It's sort of a weird question to think about. Let me elaborate a little bit. Here's an image. Um, I want to talk about lossy compression. And I also want to get at um, what, like, what is the real point of having compression in practice? Besides maybe, oh, you know, we have very, we, we've um, come through an environment, so computing has evolved in such a way that there were lots of moments in history where we had very little disk space. I, I don't want it to be the case that the only reason compression really exists is because of strange, nebulous, practical considerations like I don't have very much disk space right now in this early computer. Um, so I want to talk about an application of compression that has a lot of constraints. Um, which is ultimately streaming video compression. But to get there, I want to talk about images first. Um, there are lots of reasons to use lossy compression. So audio is another example. Because we only have so much time left in this course, and of course so much patience, we're going to mainly use images and video as a case study. Now one thing I would invite you to do for these lectures, I think the whole rest of the course, is pull up the slides on the side as I talk. Um, because if we're talking about images, I can't guarantee, like I'm going to talk about, show off some artifacts that occur in images. It may not be obvious um, to you what they look like from the video because maybe the video compression used before you see the video changes it somehow. So if you pull up the slides, you can look at the same image I'm looking at. So here, this image is a 500 by 335 pixel image. And I'm going to assume most people have an, an intuitive idea of what images and pixels are. Um, the key thing is that we're going to assume that by default, the, the natural format of every image is RGB, which is that each pixel is stored as a triple RG and B, and each of the individual pieces um, in the triple is 8 bits. So that would mean that each pixel is 24 bits. Um, now, the choice of RGB versus something else is arbitrary, and we should be careful about that. So a key thing to remember about RGB is that um, we assume when we are blending the colors for RGB, so here's a pixel whose red, green, and blue components are all zero. We assume that RGB blends like light, not like paint, which means that a higher value is like blending a, um, so lots of red light, lots of green light, lots of blue light. This would be a, the maxed out RGB pixel. This would be white. If you blend different colors of light, you get a brighter color. If you blend different colors of paint, you get a darker color. So red, green, and blue RGB is mixed like light, which means that 000, zero, zero is black and 255, 255, 255 is white. Now, the reason we have three primary colors is, I, I suppose, because human perception is dictated that we need that much to represent all the colors that we think are necessary to see. It's worth considering, interestingly, that um, we think that we that what we'll see in an RGB represented image, like this photograph, is sort of natural and represents all possible colors. Maybe the reason we all think that in 2020 is we've spent so much of our lives looking at image representations that have been digitized, not just on screens, but also um, if you look at um, printed media or posters or, or whatever, often they've been digitized at some point. So maybe we only think that RGB represents natural a natural color system because we've spent so much time staring at the result of RGB quantization in our lives. That's another weird existential point to make. Um, so in any case, the, the choice of red, green, and blue as the primary colors is arbitrary. There's lots of other choices that would work. It just turns out because of um, um, historical um, stuff, going back to the use of the original color tube displays that used red, green, and blue, that we tend to use red, green, and blue. Now, it's also true that a lot of um, color formats do not use red, green, and blue internally. They take RGB data and they produce RGB data, but in the meantime, they do a coordinate transformation. Um, old analog color TV, for example, represented um, the uh, each pixel, for lack of a better word, they, they weren't really discrete pixels, in a format called YIQ, where Y was a luminance signal, so brightness, and this was sort of a polar coordinates representation of color. Um, so one of them was actually an angle, uh, whereas um, Digital tele broadcast TV uses something, and what we'll discover, streaming video and our image compression uses something, a color system called YCBCR, which where Y represents sort of a combination of brightness and green for reasons that will become clear in the next lecture. And these two represent sort of difference values, for lack of a better term, to describe how to extract blue and red. Uh, and it turns out that representing it in that format can actually lead to a lot of benefits. So the use of RGB is arbitrary. That's our key point for this slide. 
Now, if I were to store this in the raw, uncompressed representation, it would be 500K by the natural calculation. So the number of pixels times the number of bytes per pixel. So about 500K, 502,000 bytes. And of course, this is the question. You know, can we reduce the space requirement of this image? It's 500K. Can we do better? Keeping in mind that um, the total number of pixels in this image is this number, 500 times 335 which is about 100, and let's just approximate that, it's about 160,000, which is 0 0.16 megapixels. And think about how much hand-wringing goes on about how many megapixels a camera is. Keeping in mind this image, which is quite identifiable as a photograph, is 0.16 megapixels. And also keep in mind that if 0.16 megapixels requires 500K, imagine how much um, 10 megapixels would require uncompressed. So what I might do is, I, if I represent the image as a raw 24-bit array, so an array of 500 by 335 24-bit RGB triples, it's this number of bytes. So just raw with no other metadata or anything else. If I take that array and I throw it into deflate or, or bzip or LZMA, I get these numbers. So deflate's the worst, LZMA is the best, that shouldn't surprise us too much. We're getting down uh, to about 300K. And I can also use PNG. So PNG is a lossless format. And uh, it's specialized for images, and it does some pre... It's interesting because PNG ultimately is just a pre-processing stage followed by deflate. So it's actually using this scheme. Um, it just does some pre-processing, which amounts to delta compression, basically, um, or amounts to predictive delta compression. And uh, it, it gets down to 270K. So I get a compression ratio of almost 2 here. So I went from 500K to 270K with PNG which is pretty good. That's respectable for lossless compression. Now, none of these give me above a ratio of above 2, and none of them can... Wait a minute. None of them can guarantee me... Why are we suddenly caring about that? Guarantee any particular compression ratio? So, so that's a weird requirement. We've never had that before. In fact, we've explicitly waived um, the right to demand a particular compression ratio because we know that compression isn't always possible. Uh, so we've got to begin talking about this question. Why do we compress stuff at all? What is, what's the deal with compression? What's the point? Um, is there really any point to doing any compression? Or is this just another sort of neat topic to talk about? Is, it, is this just going to be a course about discuss, discussing some neat topic that isn't necessarily directly practical, but something it's good to know about? Um, this is the kind of question I wanted to wait until after the drop date to ask. Seriously, uh, what is it, like, why have we been studying compression this whole time except as a set of arbitrary constraints we impose on ourselves that we then strive to meet? Is there any reason that we should do it? So I guess we can argue that compression, as, we've, as we know it, is just a system for converting processing time and resources into space savings. It's a way of spending processing time in exchange for using less space to store something. Um, and maybe using less bandwidth if I have to transmit it over a network. Uh, and the reason that we apparently care about this is that historically we've, not, we've had a limited amount of storage space. We've had a limited amount of bandwidth, a limited amount of disk space, and we've tended to have more processing time or had, had an easier time adding processing time to our computation than adding disk space. The logic, of course, being I'd rather spend an extra hour compressing something than go out and buy a new hard drive. Um, and so the problem with this is that from, an, from a sort of a philosophical point of view, what if computers had evolved differently? What if for some reason space was always plentiful? What if it were never a problem? Maybe nobody would have ever cared about compression. If we always had way less, if the bottleneck was always processor time and not storage space, this course wouldn't need to exist, I guess. Um, and we know because we've spent so much time talking about lossless compression that we can never expect it. We just hope that it works. We hope that we can achieve something um, uh, and save some disk space. And it's worth spending a bit of processing time to do that. Now, I will add, I mean, and this could also be affected by history, but um, it is generally the case in a discussion of things like algorithm analysis, we typically view time as the easiest parameter to increase. We want to, of course, save running time. But in terms of the other constraints, we would, for example, rather have an algorithm that takes longer in terms of time than requires more space because we know that space has an upper bound. We only have so much main memory on our machine, so we would rather use more time than necessarily exceed a space requirement. 
So we have this very weird academic dilemma, the typical kind of thing that people, that academics sit around and ponder. And you're welcome, I, I don't, fortunately we've got a way out of it. So you're welcome to pause the video and ponder it all you want. Um, but the question is, is compression actually important in the grand scheme of things, or is it just a product of a bunch of constraints that exist in the way computers have evolved? And the other side of that is, will it cease to be a, a constraint anymore as we enter a different um, uh, way of thinking about these about these resources? So an example being, up until you know 10 or 15 years ago, you needed to have a hard drive big enough to contain all of your data. And hard drives, of course, had a finite size. And they still do. Your laptop has a hard drive with a finite size. But we have access to an apparently unbounded amount of cloud storage. Obviously, the amount of cloud storage that exists is limited. But the, the limit is so high that to the individual user, we could just dump as much stuff as we want onto a cloud service. And as bandwidth gets higher and higher, it'll eventually become so easy and fast to do that that we won't even care about hard disks. And by that logic, who cares about compression? That's an, interesting, that's an interesting dilemma. And really, for lossless compression, it creates this problem that we've just been doing recreational compression. Certainly, it's useful to use less space. If I'm selling a piece of software that takes up gigabytes, I would and it's being downloaded by my customers over the internet, it's nice if I can compress it and they spend less time downloading. Back when we shipped out software on physical media, it would be nice if I could ship out my software on one disk instead of two. So of course, compression is helpful. But it's not always possible. I, I'm, I'm doing compression recreationally because I really enjoy the benefits that it brings me. But I understand that, the ben that it really is just for my own edification, I guess. It might save me some space. Maybe it won't. Maybe this scheme fails and expands the data. Too bad, but it's nice to use compression where I can. So it's sort of, we've been doing recreational compression. We get compression, we hope to always get it. We get it when we can, and sometimes we don't. Um, but it turns out that besides the, uh, the recreational uses that we're all familiar, compression has a lot of well-understood medicinal applications, um, cases where we have to use it, where the improvements that it brings are real and necessary to achieve a goal. Um, and that's one good reason to talk that we can't have a compression course without talking about lossy compression in some depth. So just to clarify, the, the assumptions we've been making about lossless compression put our priorities in this order. First, like number one, and the other ones are so far away from this that they're, they're almost invisible if we're thinking about number one. Number one, integrity must be preserved. What goes out must be identical to what came in. So if I compress and I decompress, I, might, I must have a bit-for-bit bit identical sequence of data that, that I started with. Um, if I don't, everything else is meaningless to me. I don't care how fast the scheme is. I don't care how small the size is. If the, if the integrity is not preserved, that's it. The scheme's done. Now, supposing, uh, assuming I can preserve integrity, then I want the compressed size obviously to be as small as possible. And then uh, for our purposes, we've prioritized that heavily. Um, and then beyond that, I want to use as little memory as possible and then obviously use as little processing time as possible. I think though that's a good ordering of priorities. Maybe the way that we trade off between these two can be, is a bit elastic. And you know, maybe two, three, and four can be rearranged in some context. But ultimately, number one, number two is a distant second to number one. We absolutely need number one. The other thing is that um, the, the lossless compression, as we know, is very input sensitive. I can make up two files, both 10 megabytes in size, where one of them compresses to um, 1K <laughs> in size. And um, one of them compresses to 11, well, not 11, 10.1 megabytes. We know that for every compressor, there will be files that get expanded. Um, Maybe not by much, but they'll get expanded. Um, and, and the problem with this is that that means two files of the same size don't give, just because I know how big the file is doesn't mean I get any assurance about how well it'll compress. You can even have two files of very similar contents with the same size. So an example being, I can have two files that contain the same data, where one of them contains the data in a different order and for some reason compresses much better. Um, and I, I mean, a typical example there would, would be if I have a, an apparently random um, sequence of data here. Uh, actually, that's not very random, is it? I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, if I have this versus having, for example, just all of the A's in a row, what do I have? One, two, three, four, five A's, and then all the B's in a row, um, and then all the C's. 
Obviously, this is probably going to compress better even though really these are the same data, just in a different order. And that's the issue with lossless compression is that there's so many factors and ultimately the need to preserve integrity takes precedence over everything else that we can't expect to ever achieve compression. We just hope we get the best compression we can. However, in practice, we have lots of applications and I'm going to use streaming video as my key um, point of reference here where that's not the way it works where I've got a constraint that outweighs even integrity. And usually that's something like bandwidth. I'm told, for example, that I have a 5,000 kilobyte per second connection, so five megabytes per second, and I need to stream 1080p video. And I don't care what you have to do to it. You need to make it fit in that space because if you can't, I can't do it. I, I, I mean, ultimately, I'm I can receive at most 500 kilobytes or 5,000 kilobytes per second. That's it. You've got to find a way of providing me something in that amount of space that gives me 1080p video. So find something to compromise on. So often we've got bandwidth critical cases like this where it doesn't matter what you do, you need to make it fit inside the space. Now streaming video is an obvious example because it's not only um, size critical, but it, it's literally each second of video has to fit inside of 5,000 kilo, kilobytes because that's how much data you can transmit per second. But even things like storing it on a disk, if I'm keeping hours and hours of video on my disk for basic reasons like what I'm doing now, which is editing lectures or, or something, I need to, it to fit on my disk. Um, and if it's 140, if it's 150 megabytes per second, that's not going to work. Uh, I'm not going to have enough disk space to do that. And more, I might not even have, have enough disk bandwidth to do that. My disk actually might not be able to work fast enough to store that much data per second. So I, I need to actually, um, you know, have my video file fit on my disk and ideally be able to stream it at a predictable bit rate. Um, now beyond that, if I'm, if I'm streaming, that means I'm probably compressing the data in real time and decompressing in real time. Now it's true that maybe I could compress it at a, um, in one way and then recompress it later and then decompress it in real time, but certainly at minimum the decompressor must need to run in real time. It's receiving 5,000 kilobytes of data per second. It might have a bit of a lag on how long it takes to generate the output, but it needs to be able to process all 5,000 kilobytes of data within a second because it's going to get 5,000 more kilobytes of data. It can't keep buffering it because it'll run out of buffer space if it can't protest, process the buffer in a timely manner. Now, usually we want the compressor to also be in real time, but there are cases where maybe you could compress it badly the first time and then offline later recompress so that it can be decompressed quickly or something like that. Um, but ideally, we can achieve real-time performance of the compressor and decompressor. And that means even if you have really clever tricks to get compression that fits inside of your bitrate, you can't necessarily use them unless they can be done with the processing resources you have. And then a distant third is, once you've met those constraints, so the practical reality of bandwidth and the practical reality of processor speed, then, yeah, I'd really like it if the data that comes out is as close as possible to the data that goes in. But if you have to compromise something, compromise that. Throw information away from um, the input data, if you have to, so that it'll fit in the space. Um, and uh, just for more context, um, and oh, actually, yeah, I guess what I just talked about 150 megabytes per second. You can tell that I've, I was skimming through these slides and I forgot what I already had said. So um, one frame of 1080p video, so this video that, I'm, that you're watching right now has been recorded in glorious 1080p resolution. If I were to store that in 24-bit uncompressed RGB, it would be six megabytes for one frame. And typically we record video at 30 frames per second, more or less. Old analog TV ran at 29.97 frames per second for all sorts of strange reasons. Film typically runs at 24 frames per second. And you could argue that if 24 frames per second on film is reasonably viewable, I guess, if it looks natural, then I suppose we don't need 30 frames, we could do 24. Even if we just do 24 frames per second, it takes almost 150 megabytes, megabytes, per second. So a minute ago when I was droning on about the, the um, space complexity of video, I talked about 150. I'd forgotten that this slide hadn't happened yet. So 150 megabytes per second, that is not feasible for so many different reasons. Um, one of them, of course, is that your internet connection is nowhere near that fast. There are ways these days of paying quite a bit to get a connection that theoretically can do 150 megabytes per second. But of course, that assumes that you're transmitting data from like next door. The, the, the size of the pipe, the amount of data you can transmit at a time doesn't tell you how much data you'll actually get in practice given the traffic that exists on the internet. Um, 
So that's one thing. You could not stream 1080p uncompressed video unless you had 150 megabytes per second of throughput, which you can't really expect to have. Just to be clear, in terms of bits, that's 1.1 gigabits per second for 1080p streaming video at only 24 frames per second. So obviously we need to do something to it. And even if we were to compress that losslessly, what do we, we get down to? 500 megabits per second? That's ridiculous. Um, even if we were to transmit VHS quality, so I'm I feel old saying this. When I was a kid and you wanted to record something off of TV, you would record it with your VCR, which recorded onto a VHS tape. Um, and a VHS tape was, uh, if this were an in-person class, I could bring one in and wave it around. It's about the size of some of your laptops. Uh, and it would record, of course, it's analog, so it doesn't really have a resolution. But let's say its resolution was about this, which is pretty small. Um, maybe over on the side I'll compute how many megapixels that is. That is 0. 076 megapixel resolution. That would require 44 megabits per second. Um, and just to be clear about what we expect from internet connections, the government is really hoping that by the end of 2021, 90% of Canadian households will be able to, they'll have the choice of buying some internet plan that gives them 50 megabits per second. That's it. They'll have a choice of that. The best plan they can buy should be 50 by the end of 2021, they hope, for 90% of the population. And yet somehow we can, uh, via a mobile device, over a, a, like a 4G or 5G network, we can watch 1080p streaming video um, with, with the internet provided by a mobile network. Right, so this is this is talking about residential broadband, and yet we're able to watch streaming video. So clearly, we're not trying to transmit it at this um, bit rate. Uh, and so, what we want to use is a lossy compression scheme. If we're allowed to compromise on integrity, if I can throw away bits of the data such that hopefully they're not noticeable, then maybe I will. And if the consumer of the video stream doesn't notice, who cares? So lossy compression deliberately discards bits of the input data. The goal being that when I'm done, whatever I have left is not only smaller because I've deleted some data, but also maybe it's more compressible. Maybe it's easier to compress with a lossless scheme. And the reason we've spent so much time on lossless, besides the fact that it's very, it's a very interesting application that has lots of um, direct uses, so we've seen deflate and LZMA and things, recreational or not, um, is that it turns out that lossy schemes typically do a bunch of stuff to discard data, and then um, they run the result through typical lossless pipelines. And, and, and so that's, it's, we, that's why we couldn't talk about lossy stuff until we've, we've spent some time on lossless compression, even if this were a course on just lossy compression. So the idea behind lossy compression is um, we need to fit our result inside of some amount of space. So for example, we need to fit it inside of five megabits per second or 50 megabits per second or something. We have to begin throwing stuff away. And the difficulty here is that it's a question of what do we throw away and how do we get rid of it. Um, we could just discard data. We could manipulate the input data in such a way that it's that we change it a bit so it's easier to compress. Um, and what we want to do is ideally change it in such a way that when the usually human observer looking at the result looks at it, they don't notice the difference. It's not noticeable. Um, and so we've, we've determined that we have a bandwidth concern that's so severe that lossless compression can't help us. So the ship is sinking, we have to throw something overboard. And the question is, what can we throw overboard such that when we finally get to port, um, it's the least noticeable and easiest to deal with? And so we don't want to throw the food overboard because we need that. Um, we would rather not throw away a truckload of cargo if we can throw away one thing. If we have to throw some one heavy thing away, I'd rather throw away a, a shipment of ball bearings than throw away a grand piano. Um, now it turns out that if we actually were on a ship and we had to throw stuff overboard, there is a complicated um, branch of maritime law. Uh, you can look up on Wikipedia, I think there's an article about this, the law of general average, which it comes down to basically if you're on a ship at sea that's, trans that, that's transporting goods and you have to throw something overboard because to save the ship, then the insurance policy should be designed such that everybody that put cargo on that ship has to share in that loss. Even if their item wasn't the thing thrown overboard, they have to contribute towards making up the cost of it. So that's something, if you ever get into the shipping business, if computer science doesn't work out for you, that's something to think about. I want to choose what to throw overboard such that I get the most benefit from throwing it overboard. So I want to choose a small, cheap, and heavy item, right? Something easy to replace and something that will get me the most benefit. Increase buoyancy by the largest amount. So this, this weird maritime shipping analogy has sort of gone 
it's gone overboard. Um, okay, so uh, here we've got uh, the same picture as before, but I compressed it with JPEG, which is a, loss, a lossy scheme, and it's 25K. And I think this right here should be enough, like I, this should be enough to demonstrate why we need to choose effectively what to throw away. Think about the fact that with the best lossless compression, I was down to uh, over 250K. I have gone from that down by a factor of 10. And I still have something that to the human eye looks a lot like a picture of a pear. Now, if you zoom in on the slide, um, I'd call your attention to this, maybe this area here, and some of what's happening up here in this little valley here, you will notice that there's apparently an issue with the quality of the image. Uh, and we'll see in a minute that strangely though, we've preserved the quality, the areas of quality where humans are most likely to look. If you're a human and you look at this image for the first time, you're gonna look at this. And this still looks high quality. It doesn't look pixelated, it doesn't look blurry. It still looks like a pear. The places where quality has been degraded are places where certainly if you know where to look, you can find them, but you're not likely to see them unless you know to look for them. And we're down to 25K for this color image. So we're gonna cover lossy compression using images and video. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One of which is that we're down to the end of the, we're, we're you know, in the last 25% of the course here. Um, it turns out that the techniques we cover are, are actually valid for a lot of lossy compression uh, schemes. I really wanted to cover audio, but maybe in the next offering of the course I'll do that. What's interesting about um, audio compression, we're going to talk eventually about compressing images by treating a row of pixels or an image sort of using spectral techniques, so treating them as waveforms. And you might think waveforms are actually more applicable to audio than they are to images to a large extent. And it turns out that actually a lot of the same techniques we could use for like JPEG compression would in fact be used for um, various types of audio compression. So the, the, the venerable MP3 format uses something very similar. Um, it's just a question of what information, how it chooses which information to throw away. So the other reason, of course, using images and video is helpful is that it's very it's easy to draw on an image to show all the places where quality gets degraded. It's sort of hard to do that for audio, and it's much more subjective. Um, and it's it's so yeah. So it's it, images. It's easier to sort of to talk about them at length, whereas having to keep listening to a piece of audio over and over again is a bit of a tough one. Um, so uh, lossy compression, of course, is. Um, uh, input specific because like we have to design specific schemes for images and video and sound and whatever because what we're doing is taking a type of data choosing stuff to throw away and then getting rid of it or manipulating it and of course what we can throw away in a less noticeable fashion depends on the type of data we're working with. Now what's really scary about this is typically the reason we can do lossy compression is that the thing that we're compressing is something that ends up being the, an input to a human sensory organ. So um, we don't want to do lossy compression on let's say an executable file because we know that when we restore the result the computer won't be able to run an executable unless it's, it's intact. We need to compress that losslessly. If I do lossy compression on an image, as long as the result looks to a human like an image of whatever it was, then good. As long as the salient features of the image are preserved, then that's fine. Um, and so as a result, we typically only use lossy schemes if, if what we're compressing ends up being consumed by a human somehow. So it's something that the human sees or hears or whatever. Um, and that's that allows us to take advantage of well-known biases in the human sensory system. So one thing we'll see in the next lecture is that um, the human vision is very biased towards green. So if I keep green tones in the image intact and reduce the resolution of, let's say, reds and blues, humans are less likely to notice that as if I discard colors evenly. Um, the reason why this is scary from, a, from the perspective we've been viewing compression is that suddenly a lot of our ability to mathematically measure quality is out the window. I mean, before we measured compression quality, um, I'm going to skip ahead, we measured compression quality by just saying, look, your compressor's better than the other compressors if it gets me a smaller file size. Good, okay, we're done. Like, we can wash our hands of that, compa like, it's easy. Uh, we just compare file size. Um, the problem is we've got to, we have to now measure the quality of the result because the, the result will not be identical to the input. And we now have a trade-off, which is that I could hand you again a 10 megabyte file. And one, compre one lossy compressor can turn it into 10K. And another lossy compressor could turn it into one megabyte. Okay, which one was better? 
Well, it depends. Um, this could look really good and this could look like complete garbage or vice versa. The fact that one file is smaller than the other doesn't necessarily mean that, that one compressor has done a better job. Um, and of course, uh, it could be much more nuanced. This could be 10K and this could be 11. But for some reason, the quality level here could be five times as high. Um, so we need to compare multiple things. And how do we compare perceived quality? Um, and so I just want to talk about, there's also this, the, the way that factors into asking for the compression. So not, not only what comes out, but what goes in. Um, I should be allowed to tell the compressor how to prioritize. So of course I give it an image and I say I want the image to be small. But how much of a trade-off do I want? Do I want you to compact this as much as possible, throw away as much information as you can, or do I want you to, to throw away very little information? So because th there's a question of how much do we throw away, uh, lossy compressors typically have this quality parameter in some form. Maybe it's just a number I give, like with gzip I do dash one, dash two, up to dash nine, where in gzip's case, that's a performance parameter. That's how much processing time do, do we use. We still get lossless compression. We, we could have those performance parameters for image compressors as well, but we also have this quality parameter where I would say um, an image compressed to, qual let's say, quality level one will have the highest quality um, and therefore take up probably the most space. An image compressed to quality level nine will have lower quality but take up less space. And so it's, me, it's my decision as the person asking for compression to decide where that trade-off should be. A lot of compressors also have a quality setting which is just a number of kilobytes. I could say, I want the image to take up 500K. Do whatever you have to do to make it fit inside that size. Throw away enough information that it fits inside that size. So the fact that quality is perceived is a bit of a tough one. We can't easily, we have some measurements we can use. We, we can measure the mathematical difference from between an output image and the original uncompressed input. But how do we know that that difference maps on to whether the image looks convincing? I mean, it could be that an image that differs quite a bit from the original source to a human observer looks closer to the original source. It's a perception problem. Um, we're going to get around this. We're going to use two, uh, one mathematical measurement called PSNR, uh, which I'll define in a future lecture, to, to measure the mathematical faithfulness of the output image to the input image. But we're also going to try and validate uh, the result quality just by looking at images um, in the marking. Because that's otherwise it's not fair because PSNR might miss some details. There might be some ways that we can modify an image so that, so that the result actually looks better to a human than an image with apparently better math mathematical quality. Okay, so great. Now what do we do? We, we apparently have to throw information away to get this file size down. We can get it down to about 270k losslessly, but clearly we could get it down to 25k without losing very much in terms of, our ben of the benefits of looking at it. I can get the same out of it by getting it down to 25k. And the key is, I think an intuitive measurement we want to use here is, if, some, if you were to show this image or the compressed image to somebody and not tell them that the image had been compressed, would they believe this was a photograph? That's a good intuitive way of thinking about this. Certainly, you know to go looking for quality issues in this because I've told you that it's been compressed with a lossy scheme down to a very small file size. But the question is, if you were to um, take this and show it to somebody and just say, here's a picture, does this look like a photograph to you? Even that would be a bit of a suspicious question. Um, I would say the answer is probably yes. It looks pretty convincing as a photograph. I, I'm not, I, I can't see any reason why it, it's been manipulated. So what do we do to throw away information? Okay, so first try. I'm just going to reduce the resolution. Now, maybe you can see that's probably not a good idea, but what happens if I do that? So it's a 500, so 500 wide and 335 high image. Um, if I reduce it, it would now be 250 pixels across, and then I just, I, I expand it back up to fit the space it was taking up. Um, and uh, what, 167 or so pixels uh, high? And if you look at it, you might notice, uh, if you zoom in on the slide, there are these little jagged, these are artifacts, that is to say, something introduced by a processing stage that, uh, is, vis that, that is a noticeable um, and anomalous aspect of compressions, an, an artifact. Um, these weird jagged artifacts that are the result of scaling, because there's less information now in total, and so we get this funny jagged aliased appearance on some regions, usually boundaries between regions of significantly different colors. One thing we're going to notice pretty quickly is that we can usually throw away more information in a dark region of the image than a light region because human eyes are, are conditioned to, to see more detail in lighter colors. Um, and so uh, here, the, this is a very noticeable difference here. 
um, that the, little, the stem of that leaf uh, looks very jagged. On the other hand, hey, I just reduced um, the re resolution of the image by half in both dimensions. So the actual number of pixels is sort of equivalent to taking um, a quarter of the original image. So I've reduced the size by 75%. And actually, that's a pretty, here's the original and here's the modified one. That's actually pretty good. I, I still get the detail. Yeah, it looks like a pear. And there's some grass in the background. There's some leaves. But yeah, there is some evidence of quality degradation. But I've just reduced the size by, by 75%. Um, I could reduce even further. I could reduce the size by, by down to one third in both dimensions. So I'm now, it's now down to 11% of the original size. And at this point, it actually does look visibly here, here, here. Oh yeah, up here. Um, it's visibly pixelated. And what's interesting about that is our eyes catch that pretty quickly because it's very unnatural to us. Human eyes have not really evolved to see pixelated things because where in nature would you see pixelation? And so to us, it looks very unnatural. Now, what's interesting is we could say, well, if that looks unnatural, we could always have the decompressor do some tricks. So th there are things a decompressor could do to um, maybe uh, mitigate the effect of the pixelation. Um, so it could, for example, apply a blur. If we apply a blur filter, the pixelation, the sort of harsh looking pixelation is masked by the blur, but the result now looks like an image that's out of focus. Now what's weird to me about this, this is my personal opinion, is that although this looks pixelated, like it's visibly manipulated, I actually think this is a higher quality image than this. Because, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, humans are used to seeing blurry things. It's w when your eyes are out of focus or when you're, when you're nearsighted and not wearing your glasses or something like that. Um, and so this to me looks frustrating. Uh, I, I'm frustrated by this image compared to this one, which looks low quality, but I don't blame myself for it. This is irritating to look at because it, it looks visibly as if I'm being denied information. Like I want to focus my eyes, but I can't. So we're allowed to do this. So it turns out that the use of, of judicious blur techniques is a common uh, tool in the toolbox of um, lossy compression schemes, especially for video. So for video, for streaming video, it's often uh, t types of smoothing and blurring operations are often employed um, to mask strange transitions. The issue here is that I'm applying the blur uniformly. You might notice, although it looks pixelated, I don't have as much of a problem with the middle as I do with the edge of the pair. So if I were to have the decompressor only apply a blur to part of it, the image would look still subjectively somewhat sharp while uh, masking some of the obvious artifacts. And a key issue with artifacts is that there's a typical, the typical issue with them is that when a human sees one of them, they'll begin looking for all of them. So if you can make the image just convincing enough that there are no obvious artifacts, most people looking at the image won't know to look for artifacts. But if there's one noticeable artifact, humans that stare at it will say, okay, that looks off, and they'll begin looking carefully at the rest of the image. And so this is, um, there's a bit of misdirection that goes into designing lossy compression schemes. So um, obviously I'm, I've removed 89% of the information in the image if I scale it by one third in both dimensions. So of course I should expect if I'm deleting 89% of the information, I'm going to lose some quality. And in an absolute sense, it doesn't matter which 89% of information I delete, I'm going to lose a lot of uh, quality. The issue is there are some types of quality where a drop is much less noticeable to humans. And I think neither of these techniques, the pixelated one or the blurred version, really do that. We, we have more careful changes we could make that would allow us to remove the same amount of information without observing the same decrease in quality. And so the issue there is the pixelation artifacts are ugly and the blur filter is, is also um, frustrating to look at. It, it doesn't, it, and also we don't know, like we've lost salience of the image as well. How do I know this wasn't a, a, a blurry photo? I mean, we could take a blurry photo and, and show it to people, and they'd say it looks like a blurry, looks like the camera was out of focus. Was this a blurry photo? We don't know. It was actually a very crisp-looking photo that got blurred by a compression scheme. So we've lost a salient aspect of the image. Somebody that looks at this won't know certain details about the input image based on looking at the comp a decompressed result. Okay, so let's try removing information somewhere else. So currently, each pixel is stored in 24 bits as this RGB triple. Okay, so that's 24 bits, and that means that um, I've got about 16 million possible colors. I've got, and there are 255 different 
uh, values of the green component and 255 values of the red and blue components. Um, and so I get a full range of colors from all the different colors of reds and greens and oranges and whatever, um, but I don't necessarily need all of them. And maybe in this image, which is full of greens, it has some reddish stuff and some bluish stuff, but it's mostly full of greens. Maybe I don't need all of those different shades. Um, so let's try uniformly reducing the resolution of the, 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 the color um, in the image. So I'm going to quantize the, the um, color palette of the image. So one question, I have 16 million available with RGB um, in 24 bits. What about RGB with, let's say, um, 4 bits per pixel instead of 8? How many colors do I actually need? Do I need 16 million? Um, I certainly don't have 16 million distinct colors in this image because there's lots of hues that I'm missing. Purples and like bright purple, bright red, those are cer certainly not present in this image anywhere. Um, so what if I go from 8 bits per channel down to 2 bits per channel? So here what I'm doing is I'm taking my 8-bit color value and I'm basically just shifting out the least significant 6 bits. So it's just 2 bits. It'll be the, for each channel, it'll be 0, 1, 2, or 3. Um, and if I do that, I notice a pretty obvious um, degradation of quality. And what I'll call your attention to, I'm gonna, I'll do some close-ups of this in a minute, but what I'll call your attention to is um, down at the very bottom, you'll notice that the, gr the blurry grass in the background of the image has become this sort of flat, um, uh, dark green shade. And then there's this, the parrots. Now it's interesting because this, these are, this issue down here is pretty significant, but it's not, it's not obvious to people until they notice this situation. There's obviously something weird going on here. And then once you see one artifact, your, your eyes begin looking for more. Here's a picture with lots of different colors uh, in it. So reds, oranges, um, yellows, and greens. Um, and uh, with eight bits per channel, it looks like, it looks pretty nice. And with two bits per channel, it looks really ugly. And we've lost a lot of the image here. This, it's unclear if this is a, an artistically, um, uh, like, like uh, solarized image or something like that. Like we've actually uh, like deliberately manipulated the image. That's losing salience. So I wanna be able to show somebody my decompressed result and then assume that it's the same image or get the same thing out of it that they would by looking at the original, even if quality is missing. Here, you look at this and you say, oh, somebody applied a filter to this. Like th this is an apparently an artistic choice to reduce the depth. What I'll call your attention to is this thing. Notice that the um, on this piece of pineapple here where there was a um, gradient from a very bright shade of like a bright yellow to a very dark color. Notice how that turns into this weird discrete banding pattern. So there are very few colors available. We want to go from a bright color to a dark shade of the same color. We're stepping down through all the levels available to us, but there are so few of them that we end up with this obvious um, abrupt transition. So we go from bright sort of yellowish and we have these bands of color that form. That's an obvious artifact that usually is created by color quantization, by reducing the uh, dynamic range of the image. So there are, we've gone from 16 million colors to 64, and we've used this scale function to go from um, 8 bits to 2 bits. Although you would use a shift for this if you were, because it's all powers of 2, if we're just changing the number of bits. If I'm going from um, 255 per channel to, let's say, 167 or something, then I would use this equation, but otherwise I would use a bit shift. And the slides agree. Um, so here is the pair image with 4 bits per channel. So I've reduced the number of possible colors in each channel by half, and that's resulted in there being only 4,096 possible colors. If I look at this up close, um, it looks pretty good. I mean, the pair looks pretty good. I, I, I don't see any obvious quality degradation on the pair. If I show somebody this image, um, and then 10 minutes later I show them the original, I think that they wouldn't report that the two were very different in terms of the pair. And the leaf here and the leaf here. However, you might notice some of that telltale color banding happening down on this grass. So there, there's some weird patchy thing happening. And up here, we can see some, there is some banding. There's a, there's a light green, a medium green, and a dark green. And there's this very defined sort of region that they form. There's something really interesting happening up in the sky as well. If you zoom in on this, you'll notice there's something really weird, some weird geometric pattern there. I think that actually might be noise from the way the image was captured or stored. So the, the way I created, I didn't take this picture. I created this image from a publicly available image in a very high resolution by scaling it down at high quality. So that should ideally eliminate any artifacts from the original compression that was employed when the camera took the picture. Because cameras typically employ compression when they take a picture because the picture is so large that it needs, 
it needs to be um, reduced in size to store it at all. Um, so what's happening up there is, is an artifact. It's the result of color quantization, but the funny geometric pattern is probably exposing something that was already present in the input, but not as obvious. Um, so in general, reducing the number of colors is called quantization. What we've been doing is what's called scalar quantization. So yeah, here's the 4-bit per channel version of the fruit salad. You can see that the color banding is still present there, and it's noticeable. Somebody looking at this image would look at this, and unlike the previous fruit salad, which looks like a deliberate artistic effect, this would look like a low-quality picture. Somebody um, who's seen digital images before would look at that and say, this is, looks like a badly compressed image. Um, it looks like a bad JPEG. And then there we've got the same issue. Um, there's actually some banding visible there, and here I can see, and there's, there's something funny happening on that edge of that piece of kiwi. Um, so with four bits per channel, we do have noticeable artifacts with the scalar quantization of the fruit salad. So scalar quantization is just uniform scaling by some scalar value. Uh, I think before, for our other conversion we were using, so the scalar value here would be this, for example, to, to scale to two bits. To scale to um, four bits per channel, um, you would use 16 there instead of four. Uh, okay, so there's also this option of what's called um, vector quantization that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So the, the reason why scalar quantization is a bit of a blunt instrument is that think about this image. So this image is full of greens, and it's important, therefore, that my result, if I compress it, have as many shades of green as possible available because I don't want that color banding. I don't need so many shades of red and blue because I only have reds and blues showing up in some small ancillary regions and not very many different shades of them. Um, scalar quantization just reduces everything evenly. And, and so um, even if the image doesn't need reds and blues, I get the same number of reds and blues as I get greens, and that's maybe not very helpful. Um, for example, I get 64 colors in total if I scale to two bits per channel. But a lot of those colors are wasted. Like I get bright blue, but I don't need bright blue at all. It would be great if more of those 64 colors were shades of green, because then I could do something about this significant problem. Um, so one idea would be, let's uh, look at the image first and be careful about this because, of course, if I'm choosing my color palette based on the image, I have to tell the decompressor or whoever what color palette I used. Um, but I look at the image first, I choose a good set of representative colors, and then um, I just set every pixel to the closest representative color among the palette that I chose. This is called vector quantization because what it's really doing is each pixel has this value R, G, and B. And I've got this palette over here that's um, a, a fixed, predefined palette of different colors that I'm allowed to use. So R2, G2, B2, and so on. And for each pixel in the image, what I do is I take a pixel out of the image. It's got an RGB value. I go find the thing in my palette, the color in my palette, whose Euclidean distance is closest to this color. So I take the, the difference of them and then, and then the norm of that value. So I, I'm doing a vector operation. I'm just computing the distance of this interpreted as a vector to all the different colors in my palette and then choosing the closest one. Um, and the idea is, of course, I want in the palette, I want the color that is closest to each pixel. And then I just set that in my result. Um, so it's called vector quantization. Uh, and I've posted a link to uh, a couple of books on image processing by Berger and Burge, which are they're actually really interesting books. Um, we're not going to test too much on those. Of course, there will be exam questions on exam four that amount to, here are some images. Describe the various artifacts present and um, explain various, like the way you would get artifacts like that. Um, however, I'm, the, the contents of these books are mostly ancillary stuff. Um, we need to know about how artifacts form, but the exact algorithms for doing color quantization and things are in the books in case you want to use them on assignment five. Um, and uh, uh, the, I'm going to follow the same progression for talking about quantization techniques that the books do. So um, one algorithm the book suggests is sort of the basic naive algorithm, which as we'll see is terrible for so many different reasons, which is, okay, I want to choose 64 colors, for example, for this image, such that um, uh, the, col the palette somehow makes the image look good. It reflects the, the, the spirit of the image. And I think, well, what I could do is say, I want to make sure that the, the most popular colors are part of my palette. So I just um, rank the colors by how, many, how often, how many pixels use that color, and I choose the 64 for most popular colors. And for some reason, even though I would call this the popularity algorithm, because popularity is an English word, meaning 
you know, popularity. Um, for some reason, the, the choosing the 64 most popular colors or the N most popular colors is called the populosity algorithm using the word populosity, which apparently is a word, I guess. Um, it, not only is it a terrible algorithm, this looks awful, but it has a, it has a ridiculous name. So um, what the populosity algorithm does is it just takes, it just determines the, the, the set of distinct colors. It figures out how many pixels have each color, then ranks them, then takes the most popular ones. The issue here is that, think about it, there are lots of different colors here. There's a lot of detail here. Whereas there are probably not very many colors that go into this grass. And as a result, this particular shade of green probably appears on lots and lots of grass pixels. That makes it a very popular color. So it gets chosen as, my ref as one of my reference colors, even though it doesn't help me at all with the details in my image. S uh, similarly, there are lots of bright uh, white pixels up here. So white is a popular color too. And as a result, there are lots of colors, like this entire thing, none of the colors that make up the pair might be popular colors because each one might only appear on one or two pixels. So it's a pretty bad um, way of choosing, for at least for photographic images, it's a pretty bad way of choosing representative colors. So it's lousy, you know, let's look at it up close. Um, it looks pretty awful. Uh, I don't have much more to say about it. Zoom in on it if you want proof. Um, if I use it on the fruit salad, it's even worse. What's happening here is that due to the way that the color depth works, these blueberries, which are very dark in color, there are probably regions of them that are entirely sort of blacks or very dark blues of uniform um, um, uniform patches of color. And then here, similarly, there's probably very light colors. And as a result, because there's so much variation happening in the middle, the popular colors end up coming from the blueberries and the tablecloth, and then the whole image looks like garbage. Like we lose literally all of the interesting color that makes the image. Um, so the populosity, yeah, it's awful. Um, the populosity algorithm isn't um, very helpful because all of the popular colors might be clustered in a small region of my color space. They might all they might all be shades of dark green. When what I really want is some shades of light green or reds or blues or something. What I need is a method that can quantize um, a bit more fairly. Now, I'm not going to go into de this method is actually covered in some other course on, I think, CSC 205 or something. Um, but, and the, the method is actually pretty straightforward. So look in the book if you want to know about it. It could be helpful on assignment five. I just want to demonstrate the, how much information we can lose here. So there's this method called the median cut method. There are also lots of other really complicated methods that do this. Um, basically, what we do here is we try to choose representatives more equitably, not based on which individual color is popular, but based on which regions of the color space are more populated. So um, for example, let's think about colors that, are j that do not contain any blue component. So just, just to make it a 2D problem. So up here is the red axis, and then over here is the green axis. There could be some pixels um, that are a mixtures of lots of red and green, there's very bright colors, some extremely green pixels, some darker green pixels, uh, and then some various shades of red. Um, what I want, if I divide this up, is I would like to choose, okay, let's say I, I'm only allowed to have um, four colors. Well, what I'd probably want is to say, okay, let's divide it maybe like this, and then um, give each cluster of pixels its own region, and then every pixel in that region gets collapsed down into one color. Um, that's a little bit more fair than the populosity algorithm because the populosity algorithm could choose all the popular colors could just be these two or something like that. They could all be in that area. I, I want to use the entire color space to the extent possible. So this algorithm, the median cut algorithm, recursively partitions the color space um, to choose a set of representatives and then it, basically what it does is it takes the RGB cube, the three-dimensional RGB um, space, and it divides it up into a bunch of smaller cubes or smaller or rectangular regions and then every pixel whose color value falls inside of a particular region gets represented by the same representative color. So here I'm choosing 64 colors with the median cut algorithm. We can see there, there's some evidence of artifacts but it looks pretty good and there's definitely some um, detail loss. Some of the speckling of the pair is being lost there. So here's a close-up. We noticed in the original image the pair had sort of little brownish speckles. They're now gone. There is now also visible color banding but it's not it's not as obvious that it's a color artifact. It, it is noticeable. So this, this banding here still exists. Um, the leaves still look pretty good. There is some pretty noticeable banding happening up there. Um, oh, and here there's something weird happening. But if we compare um, 
that just describes the algorithm. If we look at this with 16 colors, we still actually get something looking somewhat, 16 colors, and we still get something looking somewhat distinguishable. Um, if we were to compare the 64 color version with median cut to the 64 color version with scalar quantization, it's, it's very noticeable. This looks pretty good. It, like, it, it's clearly different from the input image. It's clearly a loss in quality, but it's amazing how much we were able to sacrifice and still get that level of quality, whereas this looks pretty bad because it, it's a blunt instrument. With 64 colors in the median cut algorithm on the fruit salad, keeping in mind that it looked terrible and looked like a deliberate artistic filtering um, operation in, in the scalar version, here it looks like there's artifacts, like there's still banding here and here, obviously, and, and in general the quality is pretty bad, but again, we're using 64 colors and we've got a pretty um, broadly colored image and it's, it's preserving quite a bit of the quality. There is a sort of general sepia tone that we're getting off the whole image here. I think that's because there's a lot of colors in the orange and, and yellow and greenish region, and so a lot of the shades that we end up with are sort of orange, yellow, and greenish. Um, so in any case, if I limit the number of available colors by palletizing the image somehow, color banding is the obvious artifact that results from that. Um, it's not usually this obvious, and even that JPEG that's 25K from earlier, you could probably find some color banding if you went looking. Um, but uh, in, yeah, in general, you're going to see some color banding if you begin reducing the color depth. The trick, if you want to reduce it tastefully, so not to 16 colors, but let's say 256, is to find places where the banding won't be as noticeable. So between two very similar shades or in darker regions of the image where the human eye isn't likely to see them. Um, and so uh, if I use 256 colors with median cut, I get an image that's pretty much like it, it, it's actually, whoops, it's actually hard to see. Um, uh, here's a 64 color version where there's some obvious quality problems here. With 256, I, I, I'm having difficulty actually finding any of the color banding artifacts. I can see some funny noise there, some patchy stuff, which maybe would tip me off that there's an artifact. Uh, and maybe this is banding, but it's hard to tell. The pair itself is pretty much intact, which is pretty good. And it turns out that this format, I'm going to have to pronounce this format in a minute, and the slide is going to try and point out to me that this is redundant because the F stands for format. Um, this format's actually a lossless format, but it requires that the image have 250 56 colors. And so it's sort of an honorary lossy format because often this format is used to store um, photographs where we have to palletize them first. We have to convert the photograph to be 256 colors and then store it using the lossless compression this format provides. Um, and so there's the, there's the 256 color version with median cut. So again, I think that's an artifact. Um, there's a little bit of a mosaic effect happening there, which I know to be sort of color banding. Um, but I would say at a glance, it's, it, it's um, hit or miss whether this image would be seen as um, having compression artifacts. Some people might notice them, some people wouldn't. So that's pretty good. Um, if, if I palletize an image, so if I choose a set of representative colors, if I reduce the image to having some specific number of colors that I have selected, it's sort of the same as using a symbol table, really. Like I'm just defining um, a, a set of these 24-bit color values that I will then use by index in the image. So I'd be storing it by, um, if I use a, a palette that's a power of two in size, it, it takes up this much space, where this is the contribution from actually storing the palette. So I would store each uh, color in the palette as a 24-bit RGB value. And then um, the number of um, bits that I need for each pixel would just be B if the, if the palette has size two to the B. And so this is just saying, represent each pixel, represent the image as an array of those indices, and then divided by eight is to pack bits into bytes. So there's the 16 color median cut version. Here is the, um, uh, whoops, okay. I wanted a close up of the 256 color median cut version. So the image itself is 800 by 600. We're gonna have to use our imaginations here. Even with 256 colors, there's some banding happening. Um, and so I'd say in this case, we would need more colors um, than we can get uh, if we do 256. We can get from the, that format that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, the image is currently stored uncompressed with this palette. Um, it requires about a third the amount of space it would require uncom uh, uncompressed in 24-bit RGB. So if I store it without any further compression, 800 by 600 image with 256 colors, I'm saving about, um, uh, I'm, I'm down to 30% of the, or 33% of the original size, which is still pretty good. So that is below what I'd be getting with a, a lossless scheme, although um, the color banding artifacts mean I, I need to work on that a bit. 
So then we get to this format. So there's this image format I've been talking about the entire semester, and uh, there's been some, apparently, some disagreement on how to pronounce it. So let's talk about that. The image format is spelled with the letter G, which means it is pronounced GIF, like the word gift, um, not like the word giraffe, which is also spelled with a G. That's your problem to figure that out. Um, the reason we want to be careful to pronounce this GIF is because if we pronounce it with the other sound, then we end up confusing it with this brand of peanut butter. This brand is apparently GIF. I don't know. I'm not really a peanut butter person. It turns out earlier this year, um, this image hosting site partnered with the peanut butter company to actually, this is this image isn't doctored. This is a real jar of peanut butter. You can apparently buy it as, a, as some sort of weird... I, I almost did that myself, but again, not a peanut butter person. Um, you can buy this as some sort of weird joke gift for people. Um, the key, though, is that uh, the brand of peanut butter is pronounced GIF, and that the image format is pronounced GIF. Um, and it doesn't matter what even the designer of the image format says, I stand by that. Uh, a GIF image uses a fixed palette of 256 colors. So if you want to store something in GIF format, you have to get it into 256 colors. Each color is specified in 24-bit RGB. Um, the image itself is then stored as this array of 8-bit palette indices, and the array is then encoded into LZW um, in the same fashion as the Unix Compress tool. Uh, it turns out you can actually have a single image with more than 256 colors by dividing it into regions and then using a separate palette for each. So there are certain ways around that rule, but still you have to, each region has to be at most 256 different colors. Um, if I want to, I mean, so yeah, if I want to store a GIF image of a, of a photograph, um, GIF is lossless, but only once you've reduced the palette. So it's sort of a, an honorary lossy format because you have to reduce the palette to store photographs. Now what's weird about it is that that's a strange limitation. I mean, JPEG, of course, you can store whatever you want and it just loss, it, it uses lossy encoding. Um, I think the reason that GIF images are still so popular is because they have a gimmick and that's what's kept them alive all these years. It's a, GIF is one of the primordial image formats from the late 80s and it exists originally to store what we typically call line art. So not photographs, but images like if I were to make a, um, like a diagram or something. I'm trying to find a diagram. This slide doesn't have very many diagrams. Um, and the reason I think that the GIF format survived, given all of the other weird obstacles it faced, like LZW having patent issues and things, is that GIF supports animation. So not even a compression-related issue. GIF supports animation, and early web browsers supported GIF images, including animated ones. And for a long time, if you think about it, there was no easy portable way of having little snippets of, of um, video or animation besides just making a GIF image of them and posting it. Because um, certainly, you know, we have YouTube and things, and um, you could make a video and post it on YouTube. But if you want to upload something to an image board or whatever, a GIF image is a way easier. Or like posting it on Reddit or something, you, you can't easily... Um, uh, you know, make a YouTube video of a three-second thing and then post a link to it. That's a bit annoying. You can't embed the image as well as you could with GIF. And so because GIF supported animation, it, 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 it hung on for decades. Now, modern image formats do not support animation because that's none of their business. Uh, it's recognized now that if you want moving images, you should use a video format. You shouldn't bother with a still image format for that. Um, so uh, as, as a result of GIF hanging on for a long time, there are lots of tools that produce extremely high quality GIF images from photographs, just because people have actually spent time working on ways of making animated GIFs that actually look like video. Um, and they do this with a combination of techniques. One of them is clever palletization. Um, uh, and this technique called dithering. Now, we're not going to cover dithering. I just wanted to bring it up on the side as an example of uh, a way that we can make a trade-off that appeals to human eyes um, but still lo loses a lot of information. Now, what's interesting about, qu about dithering is that it actually makes the image a little bit less easy to compress by traditional methods. So here, I have um, quantized the pair image to 32 colors using the most intelligent scheme I could come up with. Um, and that results in color banding because 32 colors isn't very many. Um, and then over here, I have applied a method called dithering. So there's the quantized version. There is the 
32 color quantized and dithered version. And you would look at this and probably say there's something funny going on with it. It looks like newsprint. And it uses the same trick that's used in newsprint where it creates these regions where it's an interleaved set of dots of one color followed by a different color. So instead of the banding being uh, discrete where we're in this region, then we're suddenly in this region, the band is sort of distributed, diffused into this um, interleaved pattern of dots. The same way that um, images uh, like pictures that were printed in old newspapers were actually never printed with shades of gray. Instead, they just used black and white dots or, or black dots on white that were placed closer together to simulate darker shades. So that's called half toning. So dithering is a, a, an example of a technique that even with limit of colors can be used to smooth images over while preserving sharpness. Another smoothing technique of course would be a blur, but we saw earlier that a blur creates that sense of frustration. So here's this quantized of 32 colors. It looks pretty ugly. Here it is, and this is ridiculous. Here it is quantized of 32 colors and then dithered. Still 32 colors. And yet, so this, this kiwi here looks terrible. And the detail is largely restored. It's clearly still a bit off. But now we've actually restored the salience of the image. It's more obvious this is intended to be a photograph of a fruit salad, as opposed to maybe some weird filtered attempt at a, a fruit salad or a drawing of a fruit salad or something. Um, so dithering is a powerful technique for um, undoing some of the damage from quantization, masking some of those artifacts, although I think the color banding is still obvious there. Um, it, LZW is pretty good at representing um, the, or LZW can, can do pretty good work with this index array that GIF comes up with. Um, I mean, we can still do better with something like deflate. Uh, LZW also has the ability, like any other LZ scheme, to optimize out or to, to sort of um, backdoor RLE. Um, so if you have a region of all the same color, that will be long runs of the same palette value. And LZW does have an option, like does have a mechanism internally to handle things like that. So it, it is able to get good compression on line art. It isn't very good for compressing photographs because it's been designed, GIFs were designed to compress, you know, simple diagram style images. Um, and in general, for um, when you're using a lossless image format, the assumption is lossless image formats are much better for diagram style images or line art or schematics than they are for photorealistic um, images. So at the very end here, I want to talk about um, PNG. So the next lecture is going to talk about something called chroma subsampling, and we're working our way up to what JPEG does. We are not going to spend much time on lossless formats because we're done talking about lossless stuff. Um, we've we've learned so much about lossless stuff that a lot of JPEG will now actually be pretty straightforward to us. Only the the interesting stuff, the only interesting stuff from JPEG we need to cover is the lossy part of it. But we should talk about PNG. It deserves that. Um, so how does it get better compression? We saw earlier that if we throw our image into the into our standard tools, we get around this size. How is PNG able to do better than that? Um, so PNG, the format itself is a container, like, like the .gz container. It's got a bunch of metadata in it, and you can actually pack in all sorts of weird stuff, like color profiles or things. But it does contain, but I mean, ultimately, PNG is founded around this idea of there being a compressed image in there somewhere. So it turns out what PNG does is it applies something it calls filtering, which is a predictive differential encoding scheme, pretty much the same idea as what we covered with that topography example. And we saw back in the lecture on that, that even by using basic techniques, not even with Huffman coding at the end, we were able to compete with, and in some cases improve upon, the standard tools. Even though they do use entropy coding, we, with the right use of delta compression and prediction, were able to uh, beat those things. So what PNG does is it takes advantage of the fact that images um, can often exhibit, especially line art images, can often exhibit certain patterns. And so for each pixel, PNG will look at the neighboring uh, based on a setting you can provide. So the PNG compressor can specify for each line of pixels, should this line be predicted or not, and what prediction should be used. But you can, for example, say the value for this pixel um, can be determined by predicting its value based on the value of this pixel and this pixel. And maybe it's off by a little bit, and just like in the earlier example, we would then just encode the difference between the prediction and the actual pixel value. And we saw that in data sets like topography, where we know that there's a strong correlation between the values of neighboring cells, and that's true of images as well. So imagine if this diagram were a PNG image. Um, 
There are lots of regions of contiguous color, which would be encoded into delta values of zero. Um, and there are lots of regions, I guess in this there aren't very many regions of a, a short color gradient, uh, but there are cases where there, there actually are shades of gray involved in the rendering of characters. Um, there are cases where the prediction would be very effective. Uh, and so PNG is very effective at that. So what it does is it applies this filtering approach to generate uh, a bunch of delta values based on predictions, and then it throws the result into deflate. And it just run, and it, it actually generates a fully compliant deflate bitstream up to and including obeying rule number one. It does exactly the same thing that assignment two does. Um, the uh, the advantage of that is that because deflate includes LZSS, there is something to handle large regions of conti of uh, contiguous regions of the same color, um, because LZSS can do has sort of built in RLE functionality. Um, so that's all we need to care about for PNG. It turns out PNG is something we've actually already seen. It's just the stuff from, lecture, from the topography lecture followed by all the stuff from the deflate lecture. Um, and the last thing I want to add here is that I, this, is, this lecture has been about an hour and 10 minutes long. And I mentioned that um, if I were to take one frame of 1080p uncompressed video, so one frame of this video uncompressed is 150 megabytes. And apparently it would require 1.1 gigabits per second um, uh, to, or sorry, one, one frame is six megabytes, one uh, second of video is 150 megabytes, and that's 1.1 gigabits per second. So 150 megabytes of data go into each second of this video. Um, a typical lecture video for me uh, is the average bit rate, the average uh, amount of data per second is about 400k. That includes audio. Um, so the video is somehow compacted into, I don't know, maybe 250K, 250, 300, 350K per second. Now, one of the reasons is, of course, that what I'm recording isn't actually full motion video. It's essentially sequences of still images, except when I draw or something, there's very little motion happening. But we're able to achieve pretty outstanding compression. So we go from 150 megabytes per second down to 400K, even though I do in individual seconds of video occasionally have to render full frames. What's especially significant there is even if each second of video is one still frame 30 times over, a single still frame of 1080p video is six megabytes uncompressed, whereas I'm able to store the whole second of video in um, 400K. That's one thing to think about. So we'll begin um, the progression to seeing exactly what information is thrown away in a scheme like JPEG, and then in turn the video compression schemes that are relatives of JPEG uh, in the next lecture when we talk about different color systems to use.